the, after World War II, there was a boom that affected all, everyone. Everyone's income, all folks rose about 100% between 1949 and 1980. How about between 1981, about 2010? False. Everybody, everybody, yeah, it's false. <laughs> All of you that might want to buy a house, pay back your debts. Does California's tax policy um, help young families get started? True or false? False. false. Right. Tax policy subsidizes straw. Oh, you bet. <laughs> so um, all of you know where this location is. Um, you all walk past this. You can end the D.D. Reese right here. And, uh, <laughs> It's really delightful. The dust is blowing off this. The old uh, ice cream wrappers are everywhere. It's digging in the sun. There's no trees. Um, this is really valuable land. It's right across the street from UCLA. Why is it a big lot for the last 50 years? Pretty strange. I mean, you can't make that much on a parking lot compared to you make with a, a high-rise building. So is did he, is it kept a parking lot because parking lots are essential for life? <laughs> Need for movie premieres? Yeah, that's true, but it's only like four days a year. Um, or is the owner taxed so little that he or she, actually, I'm, it's Elizabeth Hurley's family, the actress, family that owns it, is taxed so little there's no reason why they're developing and somebody, unless somebody comes along with $100 million for that piece of land, otherwise, We'll just pay next to nothing in taxes. So what underneath this talk is really why tax policy and subsidy policies are health policies. And you don't hear that very often in this class, but it's really true. Why did California pass Proposition 13 in 1978? We had this odd guy named uh, Jerry Brown, as governor then, and uh, we had this rainy day fund, and people were annoyed with him because he wasn't spending money. Did they pass Prop 13 that leveled all the taxes forever on properties because they were worried about grandma getting taxed out of their house? Oh, you bet that, yes, that was the reason it passed. Were they worried about protecting corporations from tax increases? No. And any of you that are starting a young family and want to live out near Hollywood and buy a little bungalow are going to pay more taxes than the, 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 the Capitol Records Building pays back at the corner of Hollywood and Vine because they're paying 1978 taxes. So tax policy actually is creating all these distortions in what matters to the quality of your lives. Well, what's the most fundamental environmental health issue of all? I mean, obviously water and air, but you've got to have housing. You can't be healthy in an unhealthy setting, living in a skid row tent with no restrooms and no place to wash up, it's a recipe for disease. And so here's the hepatitis outbreak. Crying out loud. I was, by the way, head of infectious diseases from 91 to 94 in California. It was there when we were trying to put the obligatory immunization of babies and children with hepatitis A. This is the hepatitis A vaccine. This is the one that's, you're, if any of you have, you're sick as hell when you have hepatitis A. It's called infectious hepatitis. It was on six, eight weeks. You don't dare have a drink. You've got to be careful about taking the time and all. It's, um, and you feel awful. And people die of it, and their livers swell up, and they turn yellow for weeks, and they're extremely contagious. And we've had 20 people die in this day and age of a disease we've now had a vaccine for for 23 years. In some of the richest places, cities in the richest state in the United States, the rich, rich country. It's unseemly. Why are people living in these places? Well, one is we have a lot of homeless people here in California. There are about two-thirds of a million across the United States, but there's 63,000 homeless children here. Why are there homeless children? Why are there so many homeless people here? Well, I'm going to got a lot of slides in here. I'll move fast, but Here's, well, let me ask you. In a more dialogue class, I would ask you if you'd say, it's really expensive to buy anything here. It's expensive to rent. That's why people are homeless, and you would be absolutely right. It's totally unaffordable. Why is it unaffordable? We're not really building enough new houses for people who live in. We're not capturing lots of land that we should be putting 
houses on and building one, one story houses six to an acre makes no sense eventually when you've got 15 million people in a city you've got to create density and you, if you have density you have to have subways by the way there's another reason there's so many homeless one third of the people in the homeless encampments are considered to be seriously mentally ill and it's you know if you're seriously mentally ill it is a es down escalator in terms of your social status your income and so many of the people living in these homeless encampments are mentally ill and by the way one third of the inmates incarcerated in california now are seriously mentally ill so what we've done is when i was young in newark new jersey it's a tough poor city i never saw a homeless person in newark new jersey you know they were put in the state hospitals and when i was you know and i did volunteer work when i was young and the state hospitals were wonderful, but they were warm in the winter, and the food, they were clean, and the food was uh, edible, and they got medical care, and so California closed its state hospitals. We had these fancy new drugs. They were going to take care of people with mental illness. Yeah, they, they basically stupefied them and made them robotic with lots of doors. And Reagan himself took, um, uh, he was behind moving 50,000 people out of the state hospitals, he moved them all to the Democratic strongholds. That's why uh, Santa Cruz and Berkeley and lots of these San Francisco parts of Sacramento have many more mentally ill than the other parts because that's where they eventually move people. So since they closed the state hospitals, the, it was a doubling in the prison population because none of the mentally ill was then captured by the prison population. So does California spend more money on prisons or the University of California? <laughs> California spends more money on prisons than all of the state universities and the University of California put together, $13 billion. The most powerful union in Sacramento, oh, well, that's not important, male public health, the most powerful union in Sacramento is the prison guards union. They get 3% at 50. What the hell is Jackson? 3% at 50 means um, university professors get 2% at 65. What that means is if you work 20 years, you get 2% for a year, so you get 40% of your salary as a pension. New employees in the state now get 1% for every year, so you work 33 years, you get 33%. But the prison guards negotiated because they were so powerful. 3% at age 50, which meant you work 25 years, you're 50 years old, you walk out the door, you get 75% of your salary for the rest of your life, and they spend a lot of time lobbying for increases in even that. So they become an extremely powerful lobby overall. All right, so the built environment, uh, homeless people, uh, not enough places to live, expensive. Um, the second big environmental threat is one of the antecedents to this huge fire, this is what I want up in Sacramento Bay. I was up there, and you could, about one person in five had masks on because the fires were so strong. And look at these fires in Napa. That's 800 miles out. You can see the dark smoke that far into the ocean. These were immense man fires. More, more particulates, and you find can correct me, in one day from one of these fires that all the cars in the state in a year, pretty much. Um, it was just stunning. The, 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 uh, and of course, the other fires that were going on at the same time. This is one neighborhood, Coffee Park in Santa Rosa. It's basically the same track within a day. This is the before and after as the fire went moving through and searching through. And I think they've got about 50 people that they've counted as dead you know, in that fire. Well, that's an act of God. That's nature. You know, it just happens. But actually, we had the rainiest winter second rainiest winter in recorded history in California last year. Thank goodness, because we were in a drought and we needed things to grow. We got lots of dry stuff to grow. Except that the drought had caused many of the trees, and I'm talking about tens of millions of these enormous sugar pines and beautiful pines in the Sierra, are dying. If you drive along 80 and Highway 80 and Highway 5, you'll see truck after truck after truck of enormous trees that are being taken down to sawmill ships being shipped to Asia because we're cutting down so many of these trees that are now dead. Otherwise, there would be more stuff to be burned. Um, following the second rainiest year in recorded history, we had the rain hottest summer in recorded history. It's quite a combination. Off the charts, hottest September ever recorded in California. Completely dried the place out. It was a recipe for fire. 
And we feel that some of you have grown up in subdivisions like this, and I lived like in one like this when I was in Atlanta, where, you know, if you lived in this house right here, and you were maybe over here, and you wanted to get the 200 yards to the Barnes Road to get the hell out of there when they told you to evacuate right away, you couldn't do it. All your neighbors had to go, and all of them were moving to this enormous collection of one tiny uh, road to get out of there. It was really difficult to escape. We know that that's not a good way to escape. If you want to move in a, pop move a population, and the fire department knows this too, you want to have grids because people get across grids and there are lots of boats. Block here, I can go this way, I can go this way. You don't want to have this sloop and lollipop design. We knew not to build like this, and yet people said, well, I don't want the government telling me what to do. Um, I can do whatever I want. It's my land. Well, yeah, except when the disasters occur, and now some firefighter is risking her life to get to help you in this situation. We knew how not to have well, how land fires. In Oakland, in 19, Oakland, Berkeley, in 1991, 25 deaths, and it was the biggest fire on record before this last one, 3,400 homes destroyed. What were the lessons from this fire? Don't have a lot of dead brush in your house and dead trees. Um, it's better to have a fireproof roof. And, you know, they had shaped roofs, the cedar roofs, so you've got to get rid of those and have a metal roof over them. The new ones are class, actually. The newest ones are Elon Musk's glass solar roofs. They're quite efficient, and probably when you were 35 years old, it would be standard to have a solar roof that looks like a normal roof on every home. By the way, the glass shingles don't burn, of course. The old people have died in America in house fires if there's internal sprinklers. But they're expensive to retrofit, they're cheap to put in, only two or three dollars per square foot. You gotta have the water storage. This one in Oakland, the water was being pumped up the hill using electric pumps, and what happens in a big fire to the electric wires and the electric pumps? Boom, they're gone. And the firefighters were going there, didn't have monkey talkies that would connect to the other town and didn't have an overall commander fighting like 2,000 structural fires instead of one great big fire. So the command was, was all wrong. The public, this is really important. And I was in a long discussion last night about um, retrofit in Flint, Michigan, about the lead service pipelines and saying, look, don't just service pipeline fix. Do the retrofit the, uh, the fiber, the electrical, all the systems at once. Don't, if you dig up the land, you've got to really do it right, not just do one little thing at a time. It's a systems issue. And the third big threat is hurricanes. And you know where I'm going. One of the antecedents for the damage that was done with Hurricane Harvey, when I was at CDC, I had a series, actually I had a bunch of programs, but one was the emergency response program. So we supplied all the doctors and a lot of nurses and all the epidemiology in major disasters and uh, refugee camps. And we were basically the county health department in these instant cities with 500,000 people all living in tents and trying to get them enough sewage and water and measles vaccines and infectious disease control, STD control, the whole things we had to do. But one of the things I learned going out to like Hurricane Floyd and many of the others was the mental health issues were very substantial, much more than I expected. The other thing I learned, sounds sort of obvious, but schools are really important. Schools that are built to be structurally sound on higher land that don't blow over in a tornado, that can stand up to weather, that have adequate toilet and other water facilities and the rest, people need places that are safe to go and they need just uh, order. They need ways to, to deal with it. But what are some of the antecedents of, of, oh, what are the antecedents of what caused Hurricane Harvey to be so bad? Well, thank goodness the head, current head of EPA has told us we shouldn't worry about climate change because if we did, that would be an insensitive question. Well, one of the other things is what we've got money. That land where Houston is, is has a pool table for 50, 80 miles inside. They had built um, these levees and reservoir areas that were empty for the last 50 years, and everybody figured that, you know, it would never flood. I don't know. Keep talking. Ignore it. <laughs> Did you ever notice they always give the updates of the least convenient <laughs> Land there had 
subsided 10 feet because of extractions of groundwater and extraction of petroleum. The Gulf of Mexico had gone up about three feet because of the energy and the heat in the oceans and everything else. Well, my six-year-old grandson, if I told him, showed him something and said, the water went up higher here, and the land went down here, where's the water going to go? He would figure it out, but Texas hadn't figured it out. Uh, and the other thing, and I have a slide in here that really documents this. Amazing. Texas, uh, Houston does not have building codes. You have an American God-given right to build anything you goddamn please, anywhere you want me, anywhere, anything you please, anywhere you want, irrespective of floods. So what happened is after they had the third one in 500 year flood, just now, Hurricane Harvey's a one in a 500 year flood, the manager said, well, I guess that means we're okay for the next 1,500 years. <laughs> Um, but so, one, you've got more, what happens if you put more CO2 in the atmosphere, it gets hotter. You put more heat in the atmosphere, heat is energy. And with the additional heat in the atmosphere, uh, it's holding more moisture. And we've had, we now, in your lifetime, your short lifetimes, students' lifetimes, there's two to three trillion gallons more water in the atmosphere over the United, continental United States. So, I, you know, I always put this slide in because you admit it's no zoning ordinance. You don't need a letter. You can do whatever you want. You can build a top lot, children's playground, right next to the slaughterhouse and the Exide battery plant if you want. That's the extent of what's going on. And of course, they have fracking levels everywhere as well. Um, this comes into my obsession with built environment. Trees are a friend. They make things cooler. But also when it rains, the water infiltrates down into the soil far more effectively. 95% of all the moisture that lands on this parking lot goes into local creeks immediately. It probably only creeks within 35 seconds and, and it's recipe for flooding. Only 5% of the water that falls in a forest runs off. So forests are our friends because it makes it cooler, ozone levels lower, air quality better, saves money on the air conditioning, but they also prevent flooding. The United States has paved over the equivalent area of the state of Georgia, 60,000 square miles. By the way, that's enough. If it's all photovoltaic, we'd supply all the energy needs to the United States with that much photovoltaics. We then have the God given right to build whatever we want anywhere. So, for example, the big peroxide manufacturing facility, which is very explosive, had these machines that were making peroxides on the ground. And at the the generators went out, the thing exploded, and really toxic stuff was blown into the atmosphere. And so the stuff that was coming up, and people knew in advance about all this. This is the Texas Tribune's article a year before the storm saying, this is what's going to happen. These are the places that are going to flood. And this is one-sixth of all the petrochemical production and petroleum production in the United States is right in the flood area right here. You all know this. It's, on, it's been what's going on. but. Do not live in a colder than average year in your lifetimes. My sons were born in the early 80s. They've never seen a colder than average year in their lifetime. All that heat, and this is amazing to me, I just, all that heat's got to go somewhere. And since the oceans are most of what covers the planet, I love this. 250 zettajoules of energy have been dumped in the ocean just since 1970. Now, you all know what a zeta joule is. I had no idea what a zeta was. <laughs> you know what a zeta is? It's 10 to the 21. That's a lot of zeros. And that's a lot of BTU. So it's mostly in the ocean, which means getting it out is also means what happens when the ocean gets warmer? What happens to any material? liquid or material when it gets warmer? It expands. So a good part of our sea level rise it's not the glaciers melting, it's the actual the oceans going up. Sea level's gone up just since uh, my brother Jim was born, uh, 100 millimeters, about that much, but still a lot. This is stunning to me. The oceans have become more acidic. Think about how immense they are. To make the oceans more acid, this, that's a lot of CO2 that had to do that. I saw a picture of uh, Melania at a, a 
was on the escalator of APHA meeting in Atlanta, and she was there shopping for pearls in Japan. And I'm thinking, somebody should have told her that there would be no more pearls because the oceans become so acidic. I'm only halfway joking because, you know, it doesn't condense very well in acidic solutions. In fact, you want to get rid of your pearls, well, soak them in vinegar. Um, I think mention this one as well. So President Obama, you know, he knew this. He had a very good quality field group. They went to him and said, you know, if people want to build things, they've got to design for climate change. If we're going to uh, help people out with help, uh, flood insurance, we've got to design for climate change. This is the policy of the United States government in 2015 about what's going to happen with climate change. And we know what's going to happen bigger in the future. Well, along comes 2017, and the Gulf of Mexico has turned into a bath. You know, it's basically soaked there. It's 73 degrees, average temperature. You're a Texan, so you know this by heart. Anytime you put that much heat in, in, in a large body of water, any, any basically uh, cyclone that goes over, it begins to pick up far more energy. And you know how they have a low in the middle, there is a flow in the The reason that's low is it's this huge chimney going up. And so the pressure that's on you, if the air is all going this way, um, the low pressure is really a measurement of just how much heat is being driven up into the higher atmosphere. So in response to all this, Trump's FEMA chief supports cutting coverage for flood-prone homes. And with my favorite, that Trump has proposed cutting NOAA funding, the National Ocean Administration, because uh, we know it was one of the congressmen said, well, why do we need NOAA? We have a weather channel. <laughs> so um, these are very creative times. And here's, here's Trump's executive order. Two months ago, three months ago, we've now gotten rid of the FEMA, uh, the FEMA requirements in preparing for climate change. And um, in order to make sure we don't hear anything we don't want to hear, the current EPA administrator has gotten rid of half the people on all of his advisory committees. And now if you want to be in an advisory committee, let's say you're in the advisory committee on pesticides, if you've ever got the grant from EPA to study the toxicity of pesticides, you can't be on the committees because now you clearly are, are polluted by the fact that you've got a grant to research and study this. So Michael will never be on any of these. Things. I don't know if you've ever got EPA money, but um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I've been doing, I started something called the Office of Environmental OVIA, Office of Environmental Hazard Assessment, California, and Green Infectious Disease as well. In 94, they offered me the job at CDC. Um, don't you love that picture? David Satcher eventually became the Surgeon General. But here I am taking my oath of office um, to become the Director of the Realm, and that oath is derived from the preamble of the United States, that I swear to uphold and protect the people of the United States and the Constitution of the United States, ensure domestic tranquility, establish justice, and all the rest. Um, and there it is again. The common, this is public health, the common defense. It doesn't have to be Russians that we're worried about. They don't, we ought to be worried about them, but we are not. And um, provide for the general welfare. And um, there it was. So here I am in Atlanta. And to make a long story short, I'm getting more and more depressed. Um, it's like every day. I, we're just we, we're overseeing the destruction of the chemical weapons of the United States. The United States had more organophosphate chemicals, killing agents, sarin and all the rest, in Ennist, Alabama, who was enough to kill all the mammals in the face of the earth. And we had six sites like this, and if anything leaked out of there, this size would probably kill a thousand people downwind. That was just that. Then there was the radiation programs and um, child lead program and cancer clusters and birth defect clusters. It was totally fascinating, but I was also finding it hard to live in Atlanta because Atlanta is um, Los Angeles without the ocean, without the charm, uh, and much more humidity. And, uh, <laughs> And my kids wanted to go back to Berkeley. So um, I, to make a long story short, I was worried about climate change way up in the atmosphere. I was worried about um, molecules, atoms of people's bodies. And became convinced by the year 2000 that what really mattered to people, I couldn't get anywhere talking about climate. I had to talk about something people cared about. 
What we really care about is where our kids live. We are our elderly parents live, where we live, how much time we had to spend commuting. And that's when I began to really obsess about built environment and health. We build two to three million of these structures a day, a year in the United States. What's the meta message of this building? What is the most important thing in this family's existence? Car. The car. Yeah, the family's wrapped around the car, and it's a true metaphor for the United States. Twenty-five percent of the entire GDP of the United States in the 20th century was related to the needs of cars, not the needs of people. By the way, one third of all Americans don't drive. Too old, too young, too poor, disabled. Don't drive, and yet we take do a good job with the two thirds that can drive. Except that now you can have the fastest Lamborghini in the world and still get downtown at seven miles an hour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I came in, I saw this nice note about Bill McCarthy, and he was saying we ought to be eating nature's vegetables and food. We ought to be eating organic food. And I completely agree with the thing on the poster there, but this is. This surrounded all the downtowns of America for the last 30 years with farms everywhere. New Jersey was called the Garden State because it was loaded with truck farms everywhere. It's all been converted to squalk. And so the availability of healthy food now, it's coming from Chile or somewhere else, and it's not coming from our farms as well. And by the way, 6% of all the CO2 in the atmosphere that we put in the atmosphere about 18% is due to the loss of green cover and trees, the Amazon and all the rest. And about 6% of the increase is due to concrete, because it takes a huge amount of fuel to cook limestone to make concrete. And then when it cures, you put more CO2 out. So you can imagine what happens when it rains on this thing in downtown. Um, cars went bad for us, you know, until we invented guns, they were the leading cause of death in the United States, ages 3 to 34. By the, I'm being flippant here, but somehow people think that everybody having a gun in the United States, or even better, everybody having 16 of them, or maybe even better, having automatic ones, um, is a good idea. And it really, it comes out of my final thesis in my last few slides, what's the origin of this? Um, so one of the things we've worked hard on on the campus is 20 is 20. And so if you get a ticket going 30 miles an hour, even if you have an electric boost bike, um, the, uh, in 20 is plenty. Your risk of dying is about 5% if you're hit by a car as a pedestrian going uh, 20 miles an hour. There's no reason anybody should be going 40 miles an hour on our campus and in most parts of Los Angeles. If you get hit, you're mostly likely dead. I'm going to skip that one. Suppose now you're starting a young family and you move into a modern American subdivision and you want to live, you buy a house right there, it's, you have to commute two hours, but it's affordable, you got it for $380,000. And um, you make friends with the person who decides, hey, let's get together for Thanksgiving and, and we'll come on over, we'll bring the stuff and you cook the turkey, okay, yeah. So you really don't want to throw the two-year-old over the fence. Um, and so you say, well, yeah, I better drive, you know, I got all this stuff. So, I've never driven to her house 35 feet away, but I better do it. So I, 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 go, to, I go to Zillow or whatever it is, Google, and I find out that they live seven miles away and take me 17 minutes to drive to the house that's 55 feet away. This is true slide, but the, underneath the joke is a much deeper reality. We have built America for cars. We have built the America for the rapid return on investment for the developer, the builder, or the uh, people who are putting it together. We have not built America for people, because if you built for people, you wouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. Let me skip these. Sorry. So remember, I couldn't go anywhere telling people that you should worry about climate change, but this slide always knocks my socks off. Here are two cities, five plus five and a third million people. Um, one has a carbon footprint 40 times less than the other. And it's about 40 times less in size than the other. Michael knows this city well. Maybe you know this slide, Mike. Oh, jeez. Oh. <laughs> most of the people, most of the 
does evil in this room would much rather live in Barcelona than Atlanta, I guarantee you. People can have a rich, meaningful life without having to plant their behinds in an SUV two and a half to four hours a day. Um, and so it's Barcelona, but look at the difference in the 10 times the carbon footprint, 40 times the size, I just spoke a little bit. So I'm obsessed about all this stuff. It's now 2002, three, and I ask, um, I, I write this piece about how we're building America, is killing people. We're killing people the way we're building America. And I published it with Rich Kuczynski, and um, two dozen members of Congress wrote to the head of CDC, his name Jeff Cooper, and he said, fire that fool Jackson. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And Jeff calls me in, he goes, uh, this is very interesting way you wrote uh, where's your data? I said, well, Jeff, it's just obvious if people are isolated and they can't exercise and um, cars are killing people and your risk of dying of a heart attack goes up the longer time you spend in the car, it, what we're building is bad for people. He goes, Dick, we got like nine articles that cited in Paris. That's the world's literature. Nobody was researching it. And so he said, well, be quiet. He didn't fire me, but um, I had to go and find the literature. So. With that, Howie Frumpkin and I, Howie, I paid for a sabbatical, and we wrote our first book, which I'll pass on, I need back because I've got the last one, on urban sprawl and public health with Larry Frank, who will be here in April, I hope, and um, began to pull together, and that was the first book I used when I was teaching it. And then we had um, two more, more recently. This is the book I used most recently on adult environment and health. We'll start it over here. And what did I do here? Um, and this is, and I really need these back because they're expensive. Um, <laughs> but I got to pay for it. Uh, this is the four hour PBS series I get out of the scene of that form of the companion book for it. That one is much less scientific and much more emotional and cultural, but I suddenly realized that we want to get people to change and need the hardware and the software. The hardware you've got to have the data, but the software you've got to have the emotion and the things that the people really resonate with. Why are we building unhealthy built environments and infrastructure? In my last eight minutes, I will tell you about its tax subsidies. This is a shocking story. The International Monetary Fund it is in Washington, D.C. They work with researchers at Davis and elsewhere. But the IMF did a study of how much the world was subsidizing extraction of fossil fuel. You know, we need to burn more fossil fuels. 5.3 trillion U.S. dollars a year, which is more than all the health spending of all the governments in the world. It's just tiny amounts of money. And the U.S. alone is probably due about 15 billion. So we're not the biggest. The governments, or even other governments around the world, are being subsidized. We're trying to do something about CO2, and we're subsidizing all this stuff that's bad. All the CO2 going in the atmosphere is really difficult. This is how much money it is after taxes. So it's about seven trillion dollars. The world economy is only about twenty trillion dollars. The subsidies for fossil fuel is like this gigunda uh, threat that we as very. The other big tax thing, and really, is the tax revolt. In 1978, people were concerned that California housing values are going so up so fast that grandma was being taxed out of her home. She was living on a pension or social security, and she couldn't afford to pay taxes anymore. So rightfully, they wanted some kind of relief that we just flatline the taxes. People voted for it, except in the last two months, the biggest businesses, including Chevron and others, in California, snuck in a line into the proposition that said people will not have their property taxes go up beyond 1978 rates and they made corporations people. So the corporations taxes have not go up since 78, which is why the record building has not gone up. California lost six billion dollars on the very first day in revenue with that new tax change and we went back from the number one state for education in the country to dead last in terms of how much we're spending on educational infrastructure. Not to mention other kinds of infrastructure, but this is just staggering. Um, governments have to get money from somewhere, 
So where do you think they might get money? Well, they started adding more sales tax because they can't get property tax. They added the fees every time you want to do something. They wanted you know five thousand dollars for the fee if you want to put a new kitchen in or something else. Um, you are paying hotel and utility taxes, but if you own some land like the guy across the street in Lacan, you're sitting pretty. I'm not going to fix it up because my taxes will go up. So this huge incentive to not develop, to not create more housing, and not create more businesses. So this sounds odd. One thing we could do for help would be to tax land more heavily. Mm -hmm. Sidebar, any of you have been to Sacramento? Have you been walked along the K Street Mall? It's really crappy. <laughs> you know why it's crappy? Because there's no incentive for people there to develop it because the taxes are stuck back at 78 levels. If they were paying real further market value taxes, they'd be changing it. So the longer they own, the less likely they are to change. Uh, it means then that people want new businesses move out to the so I, when I used to drive up to Sacramento from Berkeley, there would be fields everywhere, and now it's buildings everywhere. Um, all the plum blossoms and they're also virtually gone. Um, but it also means that the suburbs, since when they get their taxes, the sales tax, what do you think those big tracts of land out in the boroughs want? What businesses do you want if you really need the sales tax? Sales tax, by the way, doesn't go to the state of the locality. Crazy for the state sales tax. What business do they want? They want things to generate a lot of tax. And you know what that is? It's car lots, Costco, and, and Walmart. That's why you get these acres and miles of just um, asphalt. The other incentive, this is crazy. The Miramar Hotel is still taxed downtown, downtown, uh, down near the beach. It's still taxed at the level it was in 1978. Even now, it's now owned 8% by the Miramar Corporation, and Michael Dell of the computers here owns, and his wife own the rest of it, and they pay a million dollars less a year than they would, because you know Santa Monica doesn't need property taxes, I guess. I'm almost done here, but the question was, did incomes go up in the 1950s and 60s? Yes, in the 70s. Everybody doubled. In fact, the top 5% double less than everybody else. Reagan came in in 80 and put in a tax bill that said we're going to fix everything, and here's what happened for the 20 years following that. The top 5% made a lot more money than everybody else. Look at this next slide. You ready? After tax income. So it's the taxable money that you really care about. Every company business person knows this. It's the after-tax money, not the, how much you bring in. 200% compared to the, all these people down here, the bottom 80% who voted for Trump have had no increase whatsoever. I didn't mean to say that. Wait a second. Well, this morning, the House just voted to approve their version of the tax change. This is Brookings Institution's uh, calculation of what will happen to the bottom 95%, basically everybody in this room pretty much, this is how our taxes will change. Um, and the next five, 95 to 99% now, um, we'll have a 2% uh, in after-tax increase in their income, and the top 1% and 8%, and the Trumpians in the world about 10% um, increase. 10% of you're earning 10 million a year is a lot of money. Having to pay another $500 if you're earning $25,000 a year is a lot of money. And so it's really this perverse. Thing. So what's the greatest threat of humanity? I got one more minute. You ready? The underlying value of what we're doing is greed. We are not just stealing from our poor, we're stealing from our future generations. And the immorality of this um, has become, you know, when I was young, I thought greed was Scrooge McDuck in a money bin, but it's really the social structure. Everybody needs to be an entrepreneur, hustling after you, everybody. Exxon knew full well what it was doing for 40 years, denied it. In fact, I think that we should be naming all of our hurricanes, Hurricane Exxon, Hurricane BP, Hurricane Shell, um, Marie Cat, uh, Cole, et cetera.
because that's really where a lot of the biggest storms are coming from. Greed has taken over the medical care industry um, to a profound way. Um, and I'm saying this as a grandfather, no a new grandfather. Um, I worry that what we're doing, and I'm a pediatrician, are we guilty of um, child abuse? Well, actually child abuse usually means physical, sexual, severe psychological abuse. But I think those are acts of commission. I think we are guilty of child abuse in the sense of severe child neglect, not being mindful of the well-being of our children, our grandchildren, and into the future, and not being just my kids, all kids, because the theft of what we're doing is from our future. So I'll close with a quick story. My son is adopted CDC, and he said my division director, a young woman, um, well, she's been away for a reason just left CDC. And it was a secret why she left. It was under the, um, she's not allowed to announce why she's, she was moving back to Washington State to run for Congress. And so if I can tell you anything at the end of this, it is, I have never said this in election before. Every one of you has to think about how I can take over and help run this world. Because if you think the people who have plenty of money and will take good care of you, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And you, we, you've got to really have a vision of how I become articulate, how I become knowledgeable, how I become confident, so that I can be part of the leadership that we need. Because uh, as Pericles said, uh, you may not be interested in politics, but at some point, politics will be interested in you, and you may as well be there um, at the steering wheel rather than um, being the victim of it. With that, let me stop, and let me wish you a wonderful career in the finest profession in the whole world environment.